Praise God. So uh, I'm very excited to be back. Uh, last night I really enjoyed ministering here, and uh, I think we had a good time, and the Lord spoke to us. Uh, so this morning I'm going to continue. Uh, I just want to give a brief summary of what we spoke about last night uh, in our first session. We spoke about the, uh, the process of salvation, uh, because there are certain things that the Bible points out that happens in this process. Repentance, uh, conversion, and salvation, turning to the Lord, uh, and it's important for us to understand them. Repentance on itself is not enough to get someone saved. I was, uh, you know, I, I shared yesterday I was raised in the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa. They didn't believe in giving altar calls. So I never got saved. <clears throat> and um, when I got to about grade 11, I think it was, you have to go through the catechism classes, if I guess the right word, and be confirmed. And I didn't understand anything that was going on. We were more interested to look at the girls that came, you know? and to chat to them than to listen to what these people were teaching us. But the final hurdle uh, to get through this process was an interview with the Duomini. They didn't speak about a pastor. He's called the Duomini. It's like a pastor. And so he was a scary guy because all the time that I was in that church, all the years, I never ever saw him smile. So uh, he was an intimidating man. So I don't know what his problems was. I mean, maybe he, he had an unhappy marriage. Who knows? But he was not a happy man. And so I went for the interview uh, at his study. And he asked me, are you saved? which was unexpected, <clears throat> because nobody had ever asked me that. And I grew up believing that if you don't become a member of the church, you can't get married. And there's nobody going to bury you. You know, I've, it was a, like a state church. And you cannot... If you have children, they can't be baptized. Well, they didn't baptize them, they sprinkled them with water. So I had all these fears. I was a shy guy, I was not very confident. I had very little self-confidence. And now this man asked me when I'm saved, and I say, if I'm not saved, then I'm gonna have problems. So I lied to him. I said, yes, I'm saved. Not so boldly, I mean, it probably came out a little squeaky. And uh, he said, when? Then I, I really had to think, you know. But I remembered when my grandmother passed away. Yeah, that to me was like a shock. So I said, no, when my grandmother passed away, that's when I got saved, which wasn't true either. So now I had lied <clears throat> to the man of God. And I thought I was now in serious trouble. So on my bicycle riding back home, I already started crying. When I got home, I fell on my bed and I wept. That was a real serious repentance. But I didn't get saved. Repenting by itself is not enough. You have to turn to God. You have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Amen. Praise God. So today I want to continue and I want to speak about evangelism and evangelists and their message. So if we can start our slide. The evangelist and his message. So our first slide, I have the three scriptures here that we find in the New Testament where the word evangelist 
appears. The first one is in Acts chapter 21, verse 8. And this speaks about the time when Paul was on his journey <clears throat> back to Jerusalem from Asia. He says, on that day we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. Philip the evangelist, one of the sevens, he was one of the first seven that were appointed as deacons in the church when the church grew in Jerusalem. And there were problems with the distribution of food. They called everybody together and said, let's choose seven men full of the Holy Spirit who will take care of this work for us. And Philip was one of them. Yes, thank you, Gina. And then... We also read in the book of Acts that Philip went to a city in Samaria and had a big city-wide crusade there. A lot of people got saved, healed and set free in Samaria under the ministry of Philip. So he is called an evangelist. An evangelist means somebody who proclaims glad tidings, happy good news, somebody who brings good news is an evangelist. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, where Paul writes about the ministry offices, he says, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. And then in 2 Timothy 4 verse 5, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. So the instruction is here to Timothy, who is a pastor. He is now pastoring the church in Ephesus. He says, do the work of an evangelist. Because if you don't do the work of an evangelist, your church is not going to grow. As I said yesterday, a lot of pastors, they sh their church is like a boat. And they can't understand why the fish doesn't jump in. <clears throat> but in front of them every Sunday sits their net. So if they have five rows of four people, then they have a four by five net. And unless you throw the net out, you're not going to catch fish. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. The fish don't jump into the boat. You have to throw out the net so that you can catch them and bring them in. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, Jesus spoke the parable about the lost sheep. He said, if a man has 99 sheep or 100 sheep and one goes lost, he will leave the 99 and go looking for that one until he finds it. And then he brings it back rejoicing. If we look at the statistics of the church in the Philippines, born-again Christians, we see that really the one is in the church and the 99 is lost. Amen. But as a pastor, we tend to be more concerned about the 99 than about the lost. I know I was also a pastor. But when our church was small, we did evangelism. We went out, we threw the net out, and we got people. So once we had people, and our income wasn't so bad, we became introverted. We turned in upon ourselves. Every pastor wants his 99 sheep to be the best in town. They must be the best sheep. Amen. He wants to be the best shepherd. He feeds them. He takes care of them. He counsels them. He combs their hair. He clips their nails. He brushes their teeth. They are the most beautiful, happy, well-fed sheep, and we forget about the lost. Amen. That is a problem with churches everywhere. 
We become introverted. We have programs for the youth. We have youth camps. We have parents' camps. We have children's camps. We have, you know, happy marriage camps. We have broken marriage camps. We have all these things to take care of the sheep, to make them good, healthy, strong, well-groomed sheep. But the lost remain lost. Amen. Come on, you can say amen. amen. This is not a Presbyterian church. And it's definitely not a Dutch Reformed church. Amen. Not while I'm here. Do the work of an evangelist. An evangelist is a proclaimer of good news. An evangelist is a servant to the church. You understand? When we go out, Gina and myself with a team, we go to an area, we meet with pastors, we sit down with them, we share the vision, they buy into the vision, we plan a crusade, we plan all the campaign, everything we're going to do in that area. And by the time we finished, there's a lot of people got saved. And then we leave. You understand? We don't go start a church. We don't go an air to an area to start a church. We go there as a servant to the churches that are already there. When I began evangelism, the Lord spoke to me about this. He said, you know, the scripture in Joshua 1 verse 8 says, Every place you put your foot, I have given to you. He says, that doesn't apply to you like it applies to the pastors. If there are pastors in an area that are legitimate, in other words, they are there because God put them there. They aren't there because they stole a church from their dad or whatever or split a church. They are legitimate pastors that God has put there. Then that scripture applies to them. Every place you put your foot, I have given to you. The area belongs to them. Whether they believe it or not, whether they accept it or not, whether they do something about it or not, doesn't change the fact that God has given them this area. In the spirit, they should be controlling it. Do you understand? Whatever you loose will be loosed. Whatever you bind shall be bound. So if they can come into agreement and harmonize, whatever they ask of God, it shall be done for them. But it's their area. I come as an evangelist to help them, to help them to do the work of an evangelist, to teach them how to do it, so that once I leave, they can continue. The things that we do, if we teach them, if they continue to do it after we leave, their church will keep on growing. But it's up to them. That we cannot control. Because once we finish in an area, they all say, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? Well, we've just been here. Lord, when are you coming back? There are a thousand more areas exactly like yours that we have not been to. We cannot come back here until we've been there. Do you understand? So they have to see the opportunity when it comes, grasp it, and make the best of it. Okay, right. The evangelist. So just out of interest... What about Paul? Was Paul an evangelist? Was he an apostle? Was he a teacher? Well, first of all, we see in Acts 13.1, in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. It begins with Barnabas, who was a prophet. It ends with Saul, who became Paul, who was a teacher. At that time, at that stage in Paul's life, he was a teacher. He taught people. Barnabas went to fetch him and brought him to Antioch because he knew he had ability to train people and to teach them. Then the Holy Spirit called them and sent them out. Let's just go to the next slide. I'm not just save time. Let's read just from verse 6 of 1 Timothy 3. Two, verse 6 and 7. He speaks uh, about Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. 
So here Paul speaks about his own ministry. He repeats the same words in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 and 11. Verse 11 says, To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Isn't it interesting that you would think that a man who is an apostle would put apostle first? We would. So I'm an apostle. Wow, he's an apostle. Paul first says, I'm a preacher. Can you see his passion? To preach the gospel, says, I'm a preacher. Now, obviously, you can preach as an evangelist or you can preach as a pastor and teacher in a church. But he would go where nobody preached the gospel. He would go and preach the gospel. That's evangelism. He would get people saved, Gentiles. Preach the gospel to them. They would get saved. Once they were in the church, he would teach them and bring them to maturity. The important thing I want to make a point here is that these, these gifts, these ministry gifts, are not exclusive. You're not just a pastor. Do you understand? I'm teaching now, but I'm, yes, I like to teach. As a matter of one stage, teaching, Bible teaching, was the strongest part of my ministry. It was part of my maturity, bringing me to a point. You understand? Teaching the Bible is the best way for you to become mature. Because you sharing the truth. Amen. And as I said last night, if you stick to the Word, the Word will stick to you. Amen. But Paul, even though he was an apostle, he called himself a preacher. I'm appointed as a preacher an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Amen. So even if you think, well, I'm a pastor, I'm not an evangelist. Yes, you can do the work of an evangelist. It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. As a matter of fact, it's the easiest thing to do. And by the way, apostle is not a title. Apostle is a job description. Pastor is not a title. Now I know in the church, we cannot get ourselves to call the pastor by his first name because that would be like, you know, not blasphemous but sacrilegious. He's a pastor. Show me anywhere in the scripture. Take your New Testament and see if you can find anywhere that anybody was called by a title except Jesus. Amen. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't call your pastor, pastor. You can call me whatever you want. As long as you don't call me late for lunch. Amen. But they spoke about brother. Amen. And what I preach about, appreciate about Pastor Maki when she messages me, she says, Brother Pierre, that's, what it's, that's how it should be. You understand? He says, you are, don't call one another teacher. You are all brethren. I'm the teacher. You are brothers. That's what Jesus said. Amen. Okay. <laughs> but please, call me whatever you want. And if you want to call somebody pastor, that's great. But understand, in a lot of places, an apostle suddenly, people entitle themselves. You have youngsters, they still wet behind the ears. Suddenly, they're an apostle. Apostle means somebody who sent. Nobody sent them anywhere, but they're an apostle. Bishop. You know, I'm not just a pastor anymore. I'm now a bishop. Please address me as bishop. Nonsense. Amen. You still love me? Praise God. You have to. Jesus said you must. The message. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
Those that have been declared, declared righteous, those that have been justified by faith are now required to live by faith. I cannot be saved by faith and kept by works. You understand? If I'm saved by faith, I have to continue to live by faith. That's what Martha Luther discovered. He said, this is what the scripture says. And it's not what we're doing. We have to change and line ourselves because if you stick to the word, the word will stick to you. So, next slide. There is no gospel without the reality of sin. You're not preaching the gospel if you're not mentioning sin. Because sin is what separates people from God. Sin is what is unacceptable to God. And unless they know that, why would they repent from it? We are not just trying to get somebody to make a five-degree change in his course. We want him to turn around and go the other way. You understand? We want to turn him around. Now, last night we spoke about that. Paul said, when God spoke to me, this is what he said. He says, I want you to go and open their eyes so they can repent. And then I want you to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive an inheritance. So that you have to turn people, and unless they know that they have to turn, that, is, that what they're doing is wrong, it's unacceptable to God, you're not preaching the gospel. Amen. So the gospel is not to condemn them. The gospel is to show them that they can escape the snare of the devil, that Jesus died to pay for their sin. So that needs to also be included. So the next slide there, there is no gospel without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you're not talking about the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, you're not preaching the gospel because that is the whole thing. That is what they have to accept. That's what they have to believe. That's what they have to put their trust in, that this man, Jesus, died for my sin. And if I accept that sacrifice... If I accept that, take that to myself. If I call upon him, if I say, Lord, you are Lord, forgive me. I was wrong. I've changed. I'm here. I want to be saved. If they don't come with that attitude and that expectation, they are not going to get saved. They might join your church. They might become part of the church. They might think that now I'm a Christian. A lot of people think they're Christian because they're born in a Christian home. That doesn't make you a Christian. God doesn't have grandchildren. Amen. You know what, I say, what I'm saying? The fact that your, your parents are Christians doesn't make you a Christian. God only has children, no grandchildren. Everybody has to become a child of God. Everybody has to have the opportunity to hear the gospel and respond to it. You must understand, people are what they are born into. Muslims are born Muslims. That's why they're Muslims. Most of them never had any choice. That's what they were taught. Do you understand? That's all they know. And they might have been taught certain things about you. Says, keep away from those Christians. Don't listen to them. They're bad. That's what they were taught, so that's what they believe. You can't be angry with them about that. You understand? In Pakistan, 98% of the people are Muslim. Why? Because they're born in a Muslim country. They know choice. Then when you get born, says, okay, now choose. Christian, Muslim, Buddhist. No, they says, you're a, you're a Muslim. That's it. We are the ones that have the ministry of reconciliation. We are the ones that have to plead for them. We are the ones that have to share the good news with them so that they have an opportunity to hear the gospel. That is, everyone on earth has the right given by God for them to hear the gospel and then decide for themselves. Choose life or choose death. So, the blood sacrifice of Jesus, critical to the gospel. 
Next one. There is no gospel without grace. You need to understand that this is by the grace of God. That grace can only be accessed by faith. Amen. For by grace you are saved through faith. Faith is the currency to access grace. Grace is available. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. You cannot deserve. You cannot work for it. You cannot obtain it by good actions. You're not saved because you're born into a good family. None of that saves you. The grace of God, that God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's the grace of God, that his son should die for us who are undeserving. And I have to believe that message. I have to call, if I believe it in my heart, it places me in right standing with God. And then if I call upon the name of Jesus, I call him Lord, says, Lord Jesus, believing that what I'm saying is true, then I will be saved. Then my sin is taken away, and I am made free. Amen. Praise God. So, what I want to do now, I want to preach to you the way that we preach in a high school. Is that okay? Who was ever in high school? Were you in high school? Who is still in high school? Nobody. But you all, were, can you remember that you were in high school? Can you remember what it was like? Can you remember what you were like? Okay. Can you turn back the clock and imagine that you're still in high school? Yeah. Okay. Right? Okay, you're all going to cooperate. Eh? Right? When I say do this, you're going to do it. Okay. Everybody, can I have an amen? Okay, so just tell your neighbor what grade you are in. Just tell them. I'm in grade 6 or grade 7, just so they know. Okay. Right. Some of you looking at me says, this man is crazy. Right, so this is uh, Revival Center, Praise Revival High School. Okay. <laughs> Praise Revival High School. And uh, Pastor Marbell is the principal. <laughs> right, and all the other pastors are teachers, and we are the children. So, Gina and myself have just arrived. Is it possible to move this out of the way? Because normally there's not a pulpit when we're going to preach. That's great. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> right. So, <clears throat> high school children look excited. Just try and look excited. <laughs> Okay, so Gina is with me. Gina? Yeah, to bring, your, bring the stuff with. You can, you can sit down for a while. while you, yeah, let's get you a chair. You have to stand. Okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Mayang buntak sa tanan. Ako si Pierre. Taga South Africa. Oh, yeah! And this is Gina. Ako nganak babaye. Amen. We are missionaries from South Africa. So we here this morning... And just for a short time, we're going to share with you about making the right choices. Everybody say, making the right choices. In life, if you make the right choices, your life will go up and up and up. But if you make the wrong choices, your life will go down and down and down and like an egg that falls out of a tree. Everybody say, pa. And once the egg is broken, 
you cannot put it together again. Amen. You have to make good choices in life. If you want your life to be successful, you've got to make good choices. First, I want to tell you a short story. Is that okay? Can I tell a story? Yeah. Right, there was a wise man, old wise man, and he had some students like you, and he was teaching them the wisdom of life. But one of his students said to himself, hmm, I think I am smarter than my master. I'm going to prove it, that I know more than he does. So he went outside and he caught a butterfly. He says, I'm going to go to my master and I'm going to say, Master, you are a clever and wise man. I have a butterfly in my hand. Please tell me, is the butterfly alive or is the butterfly dead? And if the master says, no, the butterfly must be alive, then I will just squeeze my hand and show him, you are wrong, and I am right. But if he says the butterfly is dead, I will open my hand, and the butterfly will fly out, and I'll be right, and he'll be wrong. So off he goes. Comes to the master. He says, master, you are a wise man, and we all respect you and love you. I have a butterfly in my hand. Please tell me, master, is the butterfly alive or is the butterfly dead? And the master went, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. making thinking sounds. Everybody make a thinking sound. Come. Mm -hmm. The master said, young man, it is true that you have a butterfly in your hand. But whether the butterfly is alive or the, whether the butterfly is dead, the power is in your hand. Now, boys and girls, I want to tell you today, your future is like that butterfly. It is beautiful, it is frail, and it is a gift from God. If you make the wrong decision, you can squeeze it and kill it and destroy your future. If you make the right decisions, you can set it free and it can soar and it can go anywhere to any place on the earth. The decision and the power is with you. Okay. Now, I see there are such beautiful girls in the school. Wow. You must have the most beautiful girls. Come on, you teenagers, you're supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> Such beautiful girls. <laughs> <laughs> and also some handsome, really handsome boys. <laughs> yes. Woo. Okay. Right, girls, show me who's the coolest, who's the handsomest guy here. Quickly, show me. Him, okay, wow, he's such a handsome dude. Woo! Ah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, come with me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yo, wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow, what's your name? I'm JC. JC? Are you sure? Because they speak, they're calling somebody else. Who are you calling? Carlo, okay. But there's someone later, Jason, that's Jesus Christ. Okay. We'll stick with Carlo for today, okay. Isn't he just handsome? Okay. Right, now, I want to tell you something about Carlo here that I know. And it's not because I'm a prophet, but I know things about him. Do you want to know what I know? Okay, so this is it. When Carlo grew up, when he was still a small boy, nobody had to teach him to lie. He already knew how to lie. They had to teach him to tell the truth. His parents never told him, Carlo, this is how you lie. No, he knew how to lie. 
You understand? It was inside of him. They would tell him, don't lie. Tell the truth. Nobody had to tell him to be cheeky or disobedient. It was already inside of him. Nobody had to tell him to be rebellious. He knew how to do it. What's true for him is true for me and also true for all of us. Thank you, Carlo. You're a great guy. When I was a boy, when I was young like this, nobody had to teach me to steal. I walked past the neighbor's yard and across, over the fence, there on the, on the grass was a red car. Beautiful little shiny red toy. I climbed over the fence. My spirit said, don't do it. As a matter of fact, to tell you the truth, because I had been raised in a Dutch Reformed church where the law was read every day. First, they read the Ten Commandments. My spirit said, you will not steal. My flesh said, go get the toy. <laughs> Guess what I did? I climbed over the fence and I stole the toy. Nobody had to teach me to steal. Nobody had to teach you to lie. Nobody had to teach you to be disobedient. It is in us, and the scripture calls that a sin nature, and we are born of it. That's the legacy we have from Adam, who disobeyed God. Sin entered and entered into all of us and spread throughout the whole universe, through everybody. It is like a shadow, because if I stand here in the sun, you'll see that I'm casting a shadow. That shadow follows me wherever I go. It's like my sin nature. I cannot shake it off. It's always there. It's always following me. The only way for me not to see my shadow is I have to turn to the sun. If I look at the sun, my shadow is behind me. That sin is what separates us from God. Now, you are no longer small children. You are now grown up. You have to make the right choices. But most of you are making wrong choices. You are lying. You are fighting. You are cheating at school. You are disobedient. You're stealing. You're smoking. You're drinking. You're watching pornography. You're having sex before marriage. You know these things are wrong, yet you are doing it. You're like a man who is standing, the light is behind him, and here's his shadow, and he follows his shadow. He's following his sin nature wherever it will lead him. That is what separates us from God. It separates us from the life and the love of God. But God does not want to be separated from you. So God sent his son Jesus. And Jesus came and showed us the life and the love of God. He came us to show us the true nature of God. He loved people and he blessed them. He even had the power to heal the sick and to open the eyes of the blind. But it was the will of God that Jesus should die for us. So he was taken by lawless hands and given over to the Romans. And the Romans tortured him. And they beat him. And they whooped him. And he paid for our sin, not with money, but with his own blood. And then he was crucified. Jesus was nailed to the cross. He died on the cross for you and for me. But the cross could not hold him. Even though he was dead on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. He rose from the dead, and Jesus is alive today. Jesus is standing open arms. He is waiting with open arms to meet with you today. You can become a child of God. You can be a friend of Jesus. You can be born again. You can have your sins forgiven. But there are two things that you have to do. Number one, you have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for you and for me, and that He was raised from the dead, and He is alive today, and He is the Savior of the world. That's number one. 
Number two, you have to turn away. You have to realize, you have to think about what you're doing. What you're doing is going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. It's like that butterfly. You're busy squeezing the life out of your future. And unless you turn away, you have to turn away from it. Leave that stuff behind you. If you're going in this direction, smoking, drinking, having sex, stealing, fighting, doing all kinds of bad stuff, you have to turn away, leave it behind. The only way that you can shake off the power of your sin nature, if you turn and face Jesus and follow him. Those are the two things you have to do. And today you have an opportunity to do that. But this is your decision. You alone can decide whether you want to give your life to Jesus or not. If you're sitting next to your best friend, they cannot decide for you. Your principal and the teachers cannot decide for you. Your parents cannot decide for you. Your pastor cannot decide for you. Nobody can decide for you. It is your choice because they did not die for you. Jesus alone, he was the one who died for you. It's between you and him. I want everybody please to close your eyes right now. If you choose today to accept Jesus, if you say today, I want my sins forgiven, if that is your choice, I want you to raise your hand. Raise one hand. Raise your hand. If that's your choice today, keep your eyes closed. We're still busy. If that's your choice today, I want you to raise your hand. Say, Jesus, today, I want to be saved. I want my sins forgiven. Now, if you raised your hand, I want you to stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Just keep your eyes closed, stand. We're going to pray. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for you, if you believe that in your heart and he was raised from the dead, you will become righteous before God. And then if you call upon the name of Jesus, you will be saved. So we're all going to pray. I want you to pray out loud following me. It is important that you pray. I cannot pray for you to be saved. You have to pray. Let us all pray together. Father God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for me. Lord Jesus, I call upon you now. I know that I am a sinner. I ask that you forgive my sin. And that you save me today. Father God, I believe that right now I receive forgiveness of my sin. I am washed by the blood of Jesus. And I am a born again child of God. I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right, let's clap for Jesus. Come on. Let's clap for Jesus. Right. Okay, you may be seated. Right. Okay, tell me who's sitting next to their best friend? Quickly. Now, you remember you at school. You're sitting next to your best friend. Say, oh, yeah, my best friend. Right. So, this is your best friend? Okay. Now, I had a best friend at school. You know what? If I felt happy, I told him. I shared with my best friend. If I was sad, they would be the first one to know. If something was going to happen, I would tell them. We were always together. We shared everything. Right? Even if I was angry, I would tell him, I'm so angry. Boys and girls, Jesus wants to be your best friend. He wants to be closer even than your best friend. You can tell him everything. And I'm not talking about fancy prayers. Just talk to Jesus. When you walk to school, talk to Jesus. When you're going home, talk to Jesus. When you're lying on your bed at night, talk to Jesus. He'll listen to you. Tell him when you're happy. Tell him when you're sad. Tell him when you need something. He'll be your best friend. The more you talk to Jesus, the better your life will become. I talk to Jesus all the time. Even if you're angry, say, Jesus, I'm so angry. 
He'll say, yes, I know, just calm down. Jesus wants to be your best friend. Talk to Jesus. Now, we're going to give you some literature that will help you. It says, what next? That tells you what to do now. There are 14 steps. Read them. Do them. Get a Bible. Pray. Speak to God. Find a good church. Find a church where they talk about Jesus all the time. God bless you on your journey forward. And if we don't see you again here, we'll see you again. Salangat. God bless you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, principal. Thank you, teachers. God bless you. Bye-bye. Okay. Right. Now, that's a variation of the way that we preach in high schools. And thousands give their lives to Jesus. Amen. And you can see on their faces, they're not just doing There are some that put up their hand because everybody else is doing it. Do you understand? They see everybody's doing it, they're doing it. But there are some you can see God has just touched them, spoken to them. And they are in the kingdom of God. Amen. Isn't God great? Praise God. Amen. Well, I think that's, uh, that's the end of our time. Amen. So, I'm going to be preaching on, su um, on Sunday. This is Sunday. I'm going to be preaching at 10 o'clock. But then I'm going to be preaching now. I preach in a crusade, which is different. Amen. And then we're going to be praying for the sick. But is there any sick here, anybody that needs prayer and want us to pray for them, then Gina and myself will pray for you now if you're not going to be here. Anybody like that? Right? Let them come. Those who need prayer. Just come quickly. We're going to pray for you. Can we have the music ministry just to come up? Praise God. Okay. Anybody who needs prayer, if you're sick in your body, if you have pain, you want us to pray for you, lay hands on you, now's the time to come. Anybody like that? You're all healed? <laughs> okay. If everybody's healed, that's great. Okay. So, wag yung magpaampo, basta yung mga <laughs> panginahanglan. Okay. So, we're gonna sing a song of worship. Okay, now. Malindog tang tanan. Tuition sa maabot na kuan. Just come here in front. Break it. 
every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire your name is power your name is healing your name
the streets. Jesus said the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name.